welcome to Drone Law Pro Radio. We're talking today about Section 333. So we've been saying for a long time that the FAA has a very tight grip on commercial use of drones in the national airspace. But we've also been told by the FAA, and we've seen evidence, that they're going to be loosening up on those regulations over time. People think because they get a Section 333 that they can now fly for any purpose. That is not and has never been true. There are a couple dozen conditions and limitations in the Section 333 exemption that you have to abide by. Over the last week or so, the FAA has made some dramatic changes to the way in which the Section 333 conditions and limitations will work. So we're going to take a look at some of those changes, which we're still analyzing, but here's the high-level view. Okay, on this part of the screen, we've got the old version of the conditions and limitations. So let's just take them one at a time. Used to be that if, in terms of airworthiness, that the FAA would grant you uh, the ability to fly whatever aircraft you identified in your petition for exemption and uh, for which you provided the appropriate back background information. So if you only asked for a 3D Robotics Iris Plus or an X8M, then you would only be allowed to fly those aircraft under your exemption. If you wanted to add more aircraft, you had to go through the burdensome process of going back and amending for a DJI 3 or as new aircraft come out, the DJI 4. The FAA has fixed that. Now the exemptions that they offer authorizes you to operate any aircraft identified in the list of approved unmanned aircraft systems under Section 333 at the regulatory docket FA 2007-3330. And essentially that is the list of all approved aircraft to date. And we'll take a look at that in a later uh, episode. But it's basically everything you can imagine that's already been approved. The other uh, interesting thing here is that if they update this list of approved aircraft, then your exemption automatically gets updated. So there have been no DGI 4s, to, to my knowledge, been approved yet. They will very soon. Your exemption will automatically include the DGI 4 as soon as that first one is accepted by the Federal Aviation uh, Administration. So that is a, a pretty substantial change. Number two foreign aircraft. So if you happen to have an aircraft that was purchased uh, from a foreign country or that is registered uh, in a foreign country, instead of having to go through the cumbersome process of finding a U.S.-based company to own the aircraft, the FAA has now loosened up on this requirement and they are allowing you to simply get a foreign aircraft permit for your foreign aircraft. And there is a process for that already under the Federal Aviation Regulations, 14 CFR, 375.41 and a form that you can get for that. So if you've got a foreign aircraft, if, you, if you're if you a foreign entity coming into the United States, you can get your Section 333. Anyone from any country that otherwise qualifies can get a Section 333 exemption in the U.S. Getting your aircraft into the U.S. and then flying those aircraft has been a challenge that is going to be a lot easier moving forward. So let's take a look now uh, at this new number three, which is the PIC, the Pilot in Command uh, Certification. And this used to be number 13 under the prior conditions and limitations. And there's been some pretty significant ch um, changes to, to some of the PIC uh, uh, issues here. 13 remains pretty much the same. Under this exemption, you must have an airline transport, commercial, private, recreational, or sport pilot certificate and an airman certificate of U.S. driver's license. So that stays the same, unfortunately, for now until Part 107 comes out, in which there'll be a small unmanned aerial system certificate being offered, hopefully by the end of 2016. Four is a substantial change. So four, four used to be number 14 under the other conditions and limitations, and there's been some big changes here. So it used to be that the operator was in charge of the operation. Now they're putting the PIC, the pilot in command, in charge of the operation, and there's been some some big uh, big changes here. So let's take a look. The PIC must demonstrate the ability to f safely operate the UAS in a manner consistent with how it will be operated under this exemption. 
So you have to be a qualified pilot. Uh, it's a self-certification thing. Uh, you have to be able to maintain appropriate distances from persons, vessels, vehicles, and structures before operating. You're supposed to go through training in order to make sure that you're able to do that, although there is no formal training required. It's just up to the exemption owner to make sure that the PIC is qualified. Uh, you need to, as a PIC, log your flight hours and make sure that if someone says, what is your level of expertise, that you've got all that logged just as any other pilot. Uh, so uh, you need to separate manned flight from unmanned flight in your logs. So let's take a look now at a new condition in the new exemptions being granted by the FAA under, under Section 333. And this is where we switch. Now the PIC is responsible for the safety of flight operation as opposed to the operator. The PIC is also responsibility for meeting all applicable conditions and limitations in this exemption, what we're looking uh, through now, and in any COA that they're flying under, whether the blanket COA or a, um, a specific COA for a particular operation. All training operations must be conducted during dedicated training sessions and may not be for compensation or higher. So they've got this little um, uh, deviation where they, they really um, don't want you running a training facility for drones um, as a standard exemption uh, without going through some very special requirements. So if you're going to do your training for the purposes of being a qualified pick, they have to be dedicated and not for hire. The operation must be conducted with a visual observer. That is the same. That can't be the same person as the PIC. VO must maintain a visual line of sight and make sure that uh, they're prizing the PIC of any problems. And here we have this concept of 500 feet, which you'll see is modified below. PIC must operate the UA not closer than 500 feet from any non-participating person without exception and you're going to see that that changes a little bit below and we're still trying to understand how to square this language here with some of the language which are the exceptions below so we've got some uh, standard items here that are the same the 8700 mile an hour rule seven is the same eight is the same nine is the same in 10 we get back to this concept of approved aircraft and you're allowed to fly any aircraft that's already been approved by the faa Let's come down to number 18. This is a big change. This didn't exist before. Tethered UAS operations are now allowed under a standard exemption. Tethered line must have colored pennants or streamers, 50-foot intervals. This requirement is for pennants or streamers is not applicable when operating exclusively below the top of or within 250 feet of any structure, so long as the UA operation does not obscure the lighting of the structures. So we've seen for some time the FAA move towards a, um, a tethered line or uh, a tethered system drone in order to be safe. And here they're saying that's great. We, we, we really uh, approve the, the tethered drone concept, uh, but we want people to be able to see the tether. 19. UAS operations where GPS signal is necessary to safely operate, the PIC must immediately recover and land upon loss of GPS. 20. This is new. If the PIC loses command or control link, must follow a predetermined route to, to either reestablish the link or immediately recover and land. So if you lose GPS and you're a commercial operator, you had better had already decided what your emergency plan is to get back home and how you're going to do that. So um, hopefully you've preset your, uh, your app to identify the structures that you're going to have to fly over. You've determined your return to home parameters. You're good to go. 22, PIC must abort the flight operation if circumstances or emergencies that could potentially degrade the safety of persons or property. So if something changes in the flight, you need to terminate the flight operation. 24, very similar to uh, previous uh, exemptions. We come to 28, which is the kind of the new 500 foot rule. And so this is interesting because above it says without exception, but then they give you exceptions here. All flight operations must be conducted at least 500 feet from persons, vessels, or vehicles and structures unless when operating 
over near people directly participating in the operation of the UAS. This is the PIC, the VO, and any other consenting people that are involved in the flight. So these wouldn't be the participants of a wedding or the owners of the home. These are people who are in the operation of the flight. B, near but not over people directly participating in the intended purpose of the UAS operation. We believe this to mean the people in the wedding, the uh, perhaps the, uh, the homeowner in a, in a shoot for uh, real estate, uh, the customer who might be attending the flight but not participating in the flight. So here we've got this concept of not flying directly over people, which is where we see these regulations going, is to keep the drone from flying over people except in limited circumstances. People directly participating in the intended purpose of the UAS must be briefed on the potential risks and acknowledge consent to those risks. Operators must notify the uh, FISDO with a plan of activities at least 72 hours prior to flying over people. This is substantial change. This is brand new stuff. C, near non-participating persons. Except as under A or, or B, a UA may only operate closer than 500 feet to a person when barriers or structures are present that sufficiently protect the person from the operation and or any debris or material in the event of an accident. So here we've got the first big, big change to the 500 foot rule. You may operate closer than 500 feet if the people are under a structure that's going to provide them safety and they're otherwise safe. Under these conditions, the operator must ensure that the person remains under the protection. It's your job to make sure they stay under the porch, under the tree, under the tent, under the structure. If there's a problem, then you've got to cease operations. Operating near vessels, vehicles, or structures, uh, this is again a substantial change. Instead of having to get permission, you must now make a safety assessment of the risk of operating closer to those objects. And so this allows you to do downtown real estate and be within 500 feet of cars or vehicles traveling down the street or other structures, i.e. neighboring properties um, that are closer than 500 feet. Uh, so this isn't a huge change from where we were before. For all operations closer than 500 feet of people directly, uh, uh, to people directly participating in the intended purpose of the operation, not protected by barriers, you have a number of additional uh, conditions that apply. And so if you've got the owner of the, of, the, of the property or the customer that's there that's not directly participating in the flight and they're not under a structure, you've got to follow a manual that contains at least the following items, plans of activity, permission to operate, security, briefing that individual on safety, communication, these types of issues. So these are the big changes that are now part of Section 333 exemptions moving forward. This is a significant increase in the types of operations that may be conducted and a big change in the overall framework. This is Enrico Schaefer, Drone Attorney, and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to Drone Law Pro Radio.